Okay. Okay. When we look at each other's face, um, the nose is right there in the middle, attracting much of the attention. Picasso even went further to illustrating these um, uh, important facial features. Yet, of all five senses, olfaction is the least understood one. There's no good way to uh, categorize all odors in the world. And there's no consensus among the experts on how many odors we can recognize in the environment. But the nose just know. And Obey, besides being good looking, he also has a very sensitive nose. <laughs> and the nose for the olfaction of the science of olfaction Behind the nose, the uh, anatomical organization of the olfactory epithelium gives us the ability to recognize many different odors. Each of the neurons expresses just one receptor gene, and neurons expressing the same receptor gene, they all go to the same glomerulus. From the neurobiological perspective, that volatile odors must be transformed in the uh, olfactory system to create an internal representation to uh, give out uh, it behavior. In the last few years, my laboratory has been focusing on inner behavior. Inner behavior is also subject to uh, internal modulation by internal physiological state, such as hunger and sexual status. Why inner behavior? Because inner behavior, as suggested by the pioneers in the uh, neuroethology field, that uh, inner behavior is the consequence of heritable uh, neural circuits in the organism. Uh, for example, that uh, newborn geese are able to recognize the silhouette of a predators. Convergent evolution has sculpted the neural circuit to uh, generate uh, a facile behavior response. So in the behavior is the epitome of the species. Furthermore, in the behavior is robust. So my laboratory uh, has been uh, uh, focused on the study of Sosafro as a model system to uh, investigate the olfactory system. And there are three, there are three good reasons, I think, that uh, uh, Sosafro is an attractive model system to study olfaction. One, because there are fewer neurons, make it possible to track information flow in the uh, olfactory system. And second, uh, 100 years of molecular and genetic uh, um, uh, studies has generated sophisticated genetic tools that allow us to go from correlation to causality. And so there's similarity between mammals and fly in terms of the anatomical organization suggests that we can learn something as a general principle from the study of the Safro olfaction. And as you know that the uh, uh, Obey's lab here is the birthplace of neurogenetic approach to study uh, olfaction in Tosafro. About 30 years ago, uh, Veronica and uh, Obey came up with this uh, simple and yet elegant behavior assay to investigate in the olfactory preference. As uh, some of uh, uh, these pictures have been shown before, that fly uh, prefer one odor. Uh, of air or the void odor um, over air. From this study, they uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, for some odors, uh, they are initially attractive to flies at low concentration and then aversive at high concentration. For other odors, they are always aversive. And furthermore, they came up with a list of uh, very interesting mutants that can be categorized into three different classes. In one class, their behavior to attractive odor is intact, and yet their aversion is defective. In the second class, is the opposite. They show um, defective attraction, but normal uh, avoidance. And the third class, they show defect in both attraction and aversion. So 30 years later, my students and I, we want to understand what is the um, uh, neural circuit that govern attraction and aversion in the Tosafro olfactory system. 
and we use this uh, 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 so-called full field optometer uh, borrowed from uh, ecology field, chemical ecology field, that uh, if we put uh, cider vinegar in one quadrant and the fly prefer this quadrant, and uh, the other quadrant is uh, filled with air. So in my laboratory that we did uh, optical imaging, and uh, as shown in this, uh, in this uh, movie here, that uh, in this particular optical plane, under two photon microscope, with the projection neuron express a calcium sensor for GCAM, the BM2 glomerulus exhibit very robust response to uh, acyl hexanoate. So, so then uh, uh, my student, uh, we look at the, um, the pattern, the glomerular pattern in response to cider vinegar, and we determine that the cider vinegar can excite multiple glomeruli. So therefore the question becomes, how does this pattern translate into attraction behavior? You, are, you can have two extreme hypotheses. In one hypothesis, it's the entire pattern that's important, that's the gospel principle. The uh, sum is more than the, uh, the whole is more than the sum of all parts. On the different, on the extreme hypothesis, you can also postulate that it is in the individual glomeruli that determine the attraction behavior. So, uh, so with this imaging as a guide, that we can start to uh, manipulate the olfactory system. We can silence individual glomeruli one at a time. Ask the question that how does that affect the attraction behavior? So here is a control, and this is a a density plot from 20 flies, each of the dot here represent one fly spent one second in that location. So when we silence the uh, DM1 glomerulus, the behavior is completely abolished. On the other hand, when we silence the, uh, uh, the VA2 glomerulus, there's a partial reduction in attraction. Uh, silencing the other three glomeruli, it doesn't affect the attraction behavior whatsoever. And then we did uh, a reverse experiment. We start with a mutation called OID3B, which is a required olfactory receptor subunit that uh, 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 gives the fly. Uh, this is expressed in many different uh, receptor neurons, and the flies are anosmic to uh, uh, odor. And then we can put back uh, OID3B uh, receptor gene in one receptor type at a time. When we did that, uh, in DM1, the behavior is completely rescued, and that's also the case of VA2, but that's not the case for the other three glomeruli. From these two experiments, we conclude that the attraction behavior to, uh, uh, to cider vinegar, although the cider vinegar is a complex odor blend, but the, uh, the, uh, the behavior is determined by individual glomerulus activity, not the entire pattern. So what I want you to remember for the rest of the talk is that um, the, um, when we try high order concentration, and at high order concentration, flies uh, are not longer attracted to uh, apple cider vinegar. So we determine that uh, DM1 mediate attraction and DM5 glomerulus mediate aversion. And when we're doing this experiment, we notice something that flies are not attracted to anything if they are not hungry, so, and therefore, that's the second part of my talk, which is to ask the question that how starvation modulate olfactory sensitivity. So here's the behavior assay that we established to demonstrate that fly um, starvation status affect the uh, behavior. So here's uh, fat flies. They just wander around in the, uh, in the arena, doesn't do anything, and it takes a long time to get to the odor center. And the, uh, for the star fly, they quickly zoom in to localize the uh, odor source. And here's the average of uh, 100 flies. As you can see, there's a great difference between starved and fat flies. So we wonder what is the mechanism to change the perception of odor or to change this uh, appetitive behavior in the fly. And we look at the literature. So here is the, uh, the summary of uh, 30 years of research in the uh, in the appetitive control field, feeding behavior. Basically, the idea is that the arterial nucleus in the uh, hypothalamus uh, has many sensors for grilling from the stomach, insulin uh, in the blood, and leptin from the uh, fat tissue. All of the information are integrated in the uh, hypothalamus to control feeding behavior. This is a beautiful model, but it doesn't afford, doesn't give us any uh, 
explanation for the uh, um, for the uh, perception of odors. As we know, when we are hungry, many odor food odors smells much more pleasant, and when we are hungry, aversive odor become less repulsive. So then we went into uh, look at the uh, 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 olfactory uh, bromeli, and Corey Root did this uh, very daring experiment and demonstrate that uh, uh, bromeli sensitivity indeed are different between fat and starved animals. And particularly here, I want to highlight this, the DM1 bromeli become much more sensitive uh, in the uh, starvation state. And therefore, the question is, the question becomes, what is the molecular mechanism for this uh, um, olfactory sensitivity difference? And we hypothesize that uh, Sean Pierre is the uh, neuromodulator that control uh, olfactory sensitivity to uh, increase olfactory sensitivity in the uh, starvation state. And this is based on three facts. Number one, that Sean Pierre is a homologue of the mammalian orexigenic neuropeptide MPY. Second, when Sean Pierre is overexpressed in the entire nervous system, flies even more and become bigger. And third, Sean Pierre peptide is expressed in the olfactory sensory neurons. So therefore, we want to test the hypothesis that Sean Pierre is the key modulator in the starvation dependent uh, olfactory uh, uh, sensitivity uh, facilitation. And here, as you can see, that the uh, 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 starvation increase the olfactory sensitivity of DM1, but when sensory neuron express the uh, RNI to knock down Schwann pair peptide in the sensory neuron, this modulation is completely abolished. And through a series of experiments, we come up with this uh, uh, model here. Uh, up in starvation, insulin level drops, and that allows the expression of the Schwann pair receptor in sensory neuron, and and binding to the Schwann pair ligand the terminal of sensory neuron become more sensitive, and this uh, determine the olfactory sensitivity. And then we ask the question, is Schwann PF the only mechanism that uh, control uh, starvation uh, dependent sensitivity in the olfactory system? And therefore, we expand our study to look at the, a very large uh, concentration of cider vinegar. As you can see here, star flies, their attraction increase to uh, certain point and then declines at high concentration. And here's a fat flies. And then we look at the uh, flies that we show MPF knockdown and show MPF receptor knockdown in the olfactory sensory neuron. And indeed, the attraction behavior at low concentration is abolished. At a high concentration, they still exhibit uh, more attraction than fat flies. And then the question becomes, what is the mechanism for, uh, for the uh, modulation at high odor concentration? And uh, Ken Ko, um, uh, he did this experiment to uh, look at what are the difference between different glomeruli at um, very high concentration between fat and starved animals. And here, he discovered that the DM5 glomerulus is suppressed by starvation, and then the question becomes, what is the molecular mechanism for this uh, starvation dependent suppression of DM5 sensitivity? And remember, DM5 glomerulus is the one that uh, uh, determines aversion behavior in the fly. And through this uh, deep sequencing uh, experiment to look at the miRNA level uh, in the antenna tissue, and we discovered that uh, one of the uh, GPCR uh, it's called tachykinin receptor. The expression level is increased by starvation. Therefore, um, we, we also had already published a paper before demonstrating that tachykinin receptor mediate presynaptic pre -synaptic inhibition in the olfactory system. And Kang one one to demonstrate that uh, here is a uh, uh, control flies. They, uh, the sensitivity to cider vinegar in DM5 glomerulus uh, is suppressed they become less sensitive here in the starved animals. And when we express tachykinin receptor INNI to suppress the expression, then this uh, uh, presynaptic uh, suppression is completely abolished. And here's the behavior here, that uh, indeed, when we knock down tachykinin receptor in sensory neuron, at high odor concentration, the behavior is reduced. And and then we want, want to perform a double knockdown experiment that 
we can turn a star fly to behave like a fat fly over this large range of order concentration. So demonstrating that there are only two mechanisms uh, for uh, two mechanisms. One is mediated by sure MPA receptor. The other one is mediated by tachykinin receptor to control appetitive behavior in Drosophila. So here is the summary that starvation does not just simply scale up or down neural activity. Starvation increases the uh, sensitivity of the BM1 attractive channel and decrease the sensitiv sensitivity of the BM5 aversion channel. Upon starvation, this open up, this create a greater difference between the uh, sensitivity of the attraction channel and the BM5 and the aversion channel, and that create a larger range of uh, order concentration that is attractive to the fly. So I have five minutes. So, um, okay. So what I've shown you so far is the approach that we use optical imaging to identify neural activity in the uh, olfactory system and then we make hypothesis about what activity is required for the behavior. And in recently, we have uh, uh, tried a different approach, which is to let the behavior to tell us, the behavior of the fly to tell us what is important neural circuit and then go to the behavior. So from behavior to behavior. So here is the, um, uh, the work by a uh, postdoc, uh, Keaoru Masuyama. And uh, the idea is that we, and we can engineer um, a transcription factor is a fusion of lax A and NFAT. NFAT is a nuclear factor of active T cells. And, um, and you, NFAT has a very interesting feature that it has a NLS. <laughs> this NLS is uh, controlled by calcium neurin and calcium neurons is activated by calcium. So therefore, we want to create um, artificial transcri transcription factor that is input into the nucleus determined, is determined by neural activity. So here is the, uh, uh, the uh, expectation upon the uh, activation of a given glomerulus, the uh, transcription factor going to the nucleus to turn one gene expression, and therefore we can mark the active neuron doing a specific behavior. And here is the uh, the reason, two facts that allow us to uh, think this will be a possible way, because uh, in uh, hippocampus neurons, and that shuttle into the nucleus upon depolarization. And in Drosophila, uh, um, that even though Drosophila does not have MFAT molecule, but there is machinery to shuttle MFAT molecule into the nucleus uh, upon uh, activation. So here is the uh, proof of concept experiment that we express uh, uh, in fact, uh, let's say in all of the projection neuron and uh, exposed to a male fly, the BA1 glomerulus is uh, labeled, and uh, exposed to uh, a female fly, the presumed pheromone glomerulus BA1 LM is activated uh, because it's labeled by GFP. So um, I will stop here by acknowledging the people who did the work. I already mentioned their name along the line. And this is a collaboration with um, Andrew Sheffer uh, in the lab and also uh, uh, Steve Mas uh, Wasserman and Scott Lindsay uh, with the uh, deep sequencing project. And thank you for your attention. The talk is open for questions. Dr. Singh? My name is Singh. Uh, I had a simple question to you. Uh, of course, feeding response is not only controlled by uh, olfactory circuitry as well by the gustatory circuitry. Uh, what would you guess are the roles played by the sensilla on the external mouth parts and the internal mouth parts of the fly? Because the test of pudding is eating. So perhaps olfactory sensilla guide the fly to home on a particular food, but the final outcome will be decided by the test sensilla, whether she likes to eat or not. Uh, thank you for raising a very, uh, very important point. I neglect to mention that uh, appetitive behavior is composed of two parts. Yeah. Appetitive behavior is composed of two parts. Uh, the first is food search, and the second part is food ingestion. So what we talk about here 
is all about food source behavior. And food source behavior probably does not, uh, does not uh, involve a gustatory system because there's no contact information. OK, um, thank you, Jingwen. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Eric Buchner. He'll speak on synapsin, a strange gene important for learning and memory. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, when, uh, while the computer is uh, running up, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers very much for inviting me. Uh, uh, with my wife um, doing experiments in the lab, actually. You can't do it in black light. And uh, just briefly, uh, the many interactions I had with uh, Ove uh, during his visits to Germany uh, and my three visits to India. Uh, apart from that, uh, I'm very grateful to Ove for sending uh, his uh, student, Veronika, to my lab at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen to do her first postdoc. And since then, we had a very uh, uh, wonderful friendship and uh, Sigi and I spent uh, six months in Bombay doing a sabbatical where we met many colleagues who are also here now. And uh, so this, uh, uh, thank you, Obey, for uh, sending uh, Veronica to Tübingen. Uh, the, okay. So the, um, the topic is it's if you open it too much, it's got envelope twelve. Envelope twelve. Can you open this? Just a little bit, wait, take that a little bit and come back. Sorry, that uh, technology problems.
So we will talk about a gene in Drosophila, which is highly conserved in evolution. Uh, it's uh, the synapsin gene that was originally uh, discovered uh, by Paul Greengard and uh, as the first uh, phosphoprotein in the brain and for his work, uh, including the synapsin um, Okay, can you hear me? No. Okay. So now we have the slide. Uh, Okay, uh, so synapsin, as the name suggests, is uh, involved in synaptic transmission. And we have seen this slide before. Uh, it shows the synaptic vesicle cycle. And uh, three different pools have been identified. Uh, one is the re releasable pool, which uh, allows uh, upon calcium entry uh, the neurotransmitter to be released by exocytosis, and uh, the vesicles are recycled and uh, returned to the uh, recycling pool. Uh, some of the recycling vesicles uh, enter the uh, reserve pool, and uh, synapsins are believed to uh, regulate the transitions between the different uh, synaptic vesicle pools. This is a very simple uh, hypothesis based on in vitro data, uh, which showed that the affinity of synapsin to uh, synaptic vesicles and to the actin skeleton exists in the non-phosphorylated synapsin and is uh, significantly decreased by phosphorylation. And so the simple assumption was that uh, now, after phosphorylation of synapsin uh, caused by, uh, by calcium entry, the vesicles are free to move to the active zone. In the last 30 years, uh, lots of experiments have been done on vertebrate synapsin, uh, which show that, uh, in fact, it's much more complicated. Synapsin has structural similarity to ATP ACEs. It uh, shows calcium-dependent ATP uh, binding, and in, in, it interacts with WAP3A, uh, and thus is uh, uh, believed to be involved, or shown to be involved, in the actual transport of the synaptic vesicles to the active zone. And also it's possibly involved in, uh, directly involved in release mechanisms. So uh, we cloned the synapsin genes uh, 15 years ago, and uh, observed several uh, uh, strange phenomena for a classical gene. First of all, this is not so strange anymore after uh, the genome has been sequenced. We found that uh, the uh, TIM gene is uh, encoded on the opposite strand, uh, and um, uh, this later has been observed to be conserved in evolution uh, all synapsin genes in, in mammals also contain a gym, TIM gene within, uh, on the opposite strand. Uh, a second peculi peculiarity was that there's no uh, um, um, st uh, start codon, no AOG that could act as a uh, canonical start codon. And so we have several possibilities to think where this protein may start. And uh, uh, therefore, we uh, uh, purified the protein and subjected it to Edman degradation and observed uh, the sequence here. Um, and lately, we uh, did mass spec to identify the first uh, amino acid 
and indeed it is methionine and encoded by CTG. Uh, the red uh, amino acid here, uh, we will uh, uh, see, um, is uh, special because it, uh, um, the genome encodes an arginine here, whereas um, the uh, cDNA encodes a glycine here. And so this is uh, 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 the fourth um, peculiarity, um, the discrepancy between genomic DNA and cDNA. Another uh, feature uh, was that we detected a stuffed codon in the middle of uh, the large open reading frame, actually separating two reading frames. And uh, the Western blot shows there are three uh, um, uh, isoforms encoded uh, up to the stop codon, possibly due to alternative, spl alternative splicing and two uh, in, uh, in the higher molecular weight range, uh, which is based, we, we showed that this is not a multimer of this, but is produced by a read through of the stop codon. So this is uh, the observation. And then we uh, ask what is the reason for uh, this discrepancy between cDNA and genomic DNA. And what, what comes to mind, of course, is uh, 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 editing of pre-messenger RNA of the synapsin gene. And the site where this is editing takes place is the PK, P, uh, conserved PKA motif in the N-terminus in the genome. It's uh, the sequence encoded by the genome is uh, LKRRFS. And in the cDNA, it's LKRGFS. And uh, this is uh, RRFS, is the canonical uh, phosphorylate, protein kinase A phosphorylation site, whereas uh, this uh, could be phosphorylated, for example, by um, kinase 2. So this uh, to demonstrate that this change in one base pair is due to uh, RNA editing. Uh, we did two experiments. We uh, um, uh, fed into the computer the, the pre-messenger RNA and observed that there's a typical uh, double strand at the site that is edited. And uh, so this is, uh, it's, uh, this structure is called the edit inside uh, complementary sequence in intron four. And a second experiment that we did was the knockout of the ADAR gene. Uh, and uh, without the ADAR, ADAR gene, uh, there was no uh, editing. And the genomic DNA was, the, uh, the cDNA had the same sequence as the genomic DNA. To demonstrate the consequence of this editing, we did phosphorylation experiments. So um, the genomic sequence uh, would encode uh, KRRFS if no editing takes, takes place. The uh, edited cDNA codes for LKRGFS. And uh, we showed that this sequence is uh, uh, dramatically phosphorylated by bovine PKA, whereas uh, this sequence is not sequenced, uh, not phosphorylated. This is just a positive control with a standard uh, substrate for PKA, and this is the mutated form. So uh, this shows that uh, the synapsin protein is post-translationally modified, and we look uh, at this more carefully by doing a, a 2D uh, um, uh, Western blot, uh, which uh, spreads out the isoforms that are, are separated by different isoelectric points. And you see that there's a very complex pattern uh, in, the, in this uh, range of the uh, small isoforms. Um, the uh, next question was, can we identify more of the um, uh, post-translation mod modification, and uh, therefore we did, in collaboration with uh, Lubeck in Vienna, uh, um, mass spectroscopic uh, identification of the phosphorylation sites and identified uh, seven novel uh, phosphorylation sites. Uh, one of them, the P464, uh, the S464, 
uh, has the consensus sequence for PKA2, PK, uh, uh, compkinase 2, sorry, and we have this Utachev phosphorylation site at uh, serine 6. Uh, so the question is uh, now, what is the function of synapsins? And uh, to study the function in Drosophilamon makes mutants. So we have knocked out the gene and uh, uh, looked for the phenotype. And the uh, simplest phenotype uh, was just recently uh, discovered by uh, Matu uh, and uh, in, of the group uh, here at uh, TR, uh, uh, NCBS. And she showed uh, that, uh, first of all, this is the, just the control staining with an antibody that recognizes all isoforms of synapsin. Uh, you get a very nice uh, staining in the Drosophila brain. In the null mutant, the staining is, uh, is uh, eliminated. And she has done uh, habituation experiments, or, uh, odorant habituation experiments in the apparatus that we just have seen from Veronica's uh, original uh, work. Uh, the wild type, Tantron S, uh, shows a very clear habituation, whereas the synapsin mutant shows no habituation. Uh, we had uh, tested a similar um, uh, plasticity phenomenon, the uh, uh, courtship suppression conditioning. Uh, if you expose uh, a f male f a fly to a mated female, it will for a while uh, vigorously court this female, and but then uh, after f uh, 30 minutes, it will be so frustrated that it stops courting this female. Uh, and if you then uh, uh, wait for some time and then expose it again to a mated female, uh, it uh, forgets the frustration and tries again. And in this, uh, the synapsin null mutants forget this frustration more quickly. The, uh, another uh, uh, synaptic plasticity uh, phenomenon, of course, is associative <coughs> learning that uh, in the uh, Tali Quinn paradigm has been extensively, uh, extensively investigated. And Martin Schwarzel and the group of uh, uh, Ron Tanimoto have extensively investigated this. And uh, they find that uh, the synapsin null mutant uh, do show learning, but the short term learning is uh, impaired. And uh, um, more data from uh, Tanimoto's group from Stefan Knappig. Um, he sh showed that it is the anesthesia uh, resistant, uh, sensitive memory that is impaired in the synapsin mutants because uh, if you could give a cold shock after one hour, the two hour memory is uh, the same as in wild type in the null mutant. Whereas if you test uh, uh, without a cold shock, uh, the synapsin mutants are sh show a severely impaired memory. These are just two different orders showing the same. And we have seen already uh, Danz and Rutabaga uh, this morning uh, as two genes uh, involved in the uh, regulation of CAMP, uh, the uh, activator of protein kinase A. And so uh, uh, Stefan tested the double mutant Danz uh, synapsin and uh, uh, Rutabaga synapsin and there is no additive effect uh, um, when you combine these two muta mutations. This indicates that synapsin and uh, the PKA, uh, CMP uh, PKA pathway is in the same uh, signaling pathway. This is another learning paradigm by Bertram Gerber's group. Uh, essentially is only this difference here, which is uh, uh, significant uh, wild type against the mutant, and uh, all the others are controls, which Bertram insists we should show. Uh, so uh, how can we, uh, I mentioned that this uh, associative learning has been ex extensively investigated. How can we incorporate uh, synapsin into the current model for 
uh, olfactory uh, associative learning. Uh, this assumes that, as, uh, or we, we know that a, a given odor uh, stimulates a subset of uh, glomeruli, uh, and uh, this is assumed to stimulate a subset, a small subset of uh, Kenyan cells here indicated in red. And uh, when you uh, give the, uh, an, an, an odor as the CS, uh, the condition stimulus, and uh, uh, electroshock as the unconditioned stimulant at the same time, you will modify output synapses that lead to a, a, a remembered aversive response or when you present food as an unconditioned stu uh, stimulus as an attractive uh, response. So how can we imagine these synapses uh, in the molecular detail? This is very similar to what has been shown in aplysia and other model system, uh, the CS, the odor, depolarize the Kenyan cells. This leads to calcium influx. Uh, the punish punishment or the reward activate dopaminergic or octopaminergic neurons, which uh, synapse onto the uh, uh, axons of the Kenyan cell and uh, near the synaptic output terminal. And uh, this uh, coincidence of uh, CS and US uh, um, activates the coincidence detector Rutabaga adenylate cyclase, which produces large amounts of CAMP, which then activate PKA. And the normal assumption is that it influences the uh, uh, potassium channel by phosphorylation of uh, potassium channel. And now we speculate that synapsin is phosphorylated uh, uh, also whenever. Uh, um, uh, large amounts of CAMP are produced. So with this in mind, uh, we uh, now need to show where in the brain is um, um, this phosphorylation take, taking place and under which condition can we increase the phosphorylation by PK in companies to, uh, at, uh, and therefore we made uh, phosphospecific antibodies or had a company make specific antibodies, and this just shows that these, anti these antisera work. Uh, so one, is, one serum is against the S6, uh, sera N6 in the uh, uh, N-terminus, uh, the conserved site, and um, we show that with this uh, uh, phosphospecific antibody uh, in uh, wild type, we get a very weak signal compared to the Panson antibody. Um, but if we block editing by a transgene in which editing is prevented, we get a very large signal. This indicates that indeed uh, the uh, PKA editing, PKA site editing destroys also in Drosophila the PKA rec recognition site. Uh, we also uh, this is the null mutant, no signal. Also, if we mutate the S6 to, to alanine, uh, to the serine 6 to alanine, we get no signal. And uh, this uh, indicates that uh, uh, if we express uh, the ALA1 peptide, which is an inhibitor for, inhibitory peptide for the CAM kinase 2, we reduce the signal. Uh, this indicates that. Uh, the S6 is not only phosphorylated by PKA, but also by uh, CAM kinase 2. The, um, uh, the other uh, serum uh, also works, but since it's not, uh, um, uh, so far we haven't seen any changes in the other serum, in, in the, uh, this other S serine 464, uh, I will skip. This data just show this uh, immunohistochemical staining with the, uh, the pansin synapsin antibody and with the S6 phosphosin antibody. And you see that there's very dramatic uh, staining here in the ring neur neurons uh, um, of the central complex. Uh, the rest of the brain is only weakly stained here. Uh, here somewhat enhanced uh, so that you can see it. 
uh, but um, and uh, the control um, if we mutate the six serin six to alanine, uh, we get no staining. Uh, if we um, uh, in, in the null mutant, the staining is also abolished. This residual staining is based on pigment migrating from the eye during fixation into the visual system. So now, the, uh, of course, the exciting question is, can we influence the, uh, the uh, distribution of uh, synapsin phosphorylation by experiments? And one very preliminary experiment from the last weeks uh, is that we compared awake and anesthetized animals, and we do see some difference in the, in the intensity of phosphorylation. Uh, this has to be repeated. Uh, the flies were not age controlled, so it could be that this is an age effect, but at least we see some differences, which we now will follow up. And uh, Mad uh, will try to uh, find uh, uh, similar changes in the habituation experiment, and we will try to find changes in the uh, olfactory learning. So to, to sum up, uh, we have a, a, in the synapsin gene, we have an unconventional translation start. We have a uh, nested uh, gene. We have uh, intron positions are conserved. We have sim uh, domain similarities to vertebrate gene. We have uh, uh, many isoforms generated by alternate splicing, by RNA editing, by stop codon read through and multiple post-translational modification. And uh, we showed that uh, synapsin is a target for PKA, which is important for synaptic uh, plasticity and interacts with sub-47, which I haven't talked about. So the outlook is, can we detect changes in synapsin phosphorylation in synapses involved in behavioral plasticity? And this is the uh, collaboration with Madi, Mani, and the Bertram Gerber group in Leipzig. So I thank... Uh, the students who over the years have contributed, uh, I thank the uh, collaboration with Veronica, Krishnan, Mani, and now Matu, and um, uh, Bertram Gerber's group, and uh, Andre Fiala, who did some imaging, uh, which I have, didn't have the time to talk about. Thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs> the talk is open. So maybe I was asleep, but um, you're, you were knocking the synapsin out in the whole animal. Yeah. So aren't you surprised that behavior was even rem remotely doing yes. anything? Well, um, yes. Uh, the first paper that described uh, the uh, synapsin knockout flies uh, has the title, Unexpectedly, These Flies Are Healthy. Um, the triple knockout mouse is also surviving. It shows uh, um, epileptic seizures and shows learning effects, but it otherwise it's fairly normal. Uh, so synapsin is obviously not necessary, as the original uh, hypothesis uh, suggested uh, for synaptic transmission, but it's necessary for fine modulation of synaptic, uh, synaptic transmission, uh, transmission, and as we now think, involved in learning and memory. In other words, there's all sorts of modulation of synaptic transmission in sure. every synapse. Sure. So, it, I don't know, it just seems very um, unusual that it would be so special in those synapses. Well, I mean, of course, we cannot exclude uh, phenotypes that we haven't tested. But uh, the standard electrophysiology in the larval nerve muscle preparation shows, uh, the standard experiment shows no difference to wild type. Uh, the, uh, only if you uh, uh, give many uh, 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 um, uh, 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 volley of uh, spikes, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, synapsin synapses, uh, synapsin null uh, synapses decrease 
in amplitude uh, in the postsynaptic signal more, more, uh, more quickly. But this is a very sm small effect. But of course, in, this, uh, in the brain where you expect the learning synapses, uh, this may be more pronounced uh, and may be phosphorylation dependent. This is the hypothesis. Yes. But then, since uh, PKA phosphorylation is so important for, uh, for uh, and, and it seems that it's the PKA phosphorylation site, which is the one that is edited yeah. in Drosophila, is there, uh, is that also biologically modulatable or is this something constitutional? The uh, editing part of it. Yeah. I don't think anybody really understands why editing is done, being, uh, has been invented anyway. Um, because, of course, you could mutate the site. Um, With tetrahymena and plants, maybe, but I don't know in Drosophila how many examples are there. Where editing? Yeah. Where, uh, about, uh, I think, 100 genes have been shown to be edited, and uh, the ADA knockout flies are very sick. They survive, but they are very sick, and we had to uh, collect many uh, sick flies in order to show this, uh, to, to sequence the CDMA, to demonstrate that the editing is, uh, uh, is just did not take place in the synapse. I think there might be questions, but we should move on. Thank you, Eric. Um, our next speaker. Hmm? Our next speaker is Vivek Yairam. He speak on sensory motor integration. Okay, is this good? Can you hear me? No. How about this? Better? All right. Okay, so it's a pleasure and an honor to be here to celebrate uh, Obed and his science. Uh, now, many of you who are at NCBS know that I visit here often, so it's a particular pleasure to be here also to celebrate the 20th anniversary of NCBS. Um, and it's actually a pleasure to speak after Eric Buchner um, for reasons that will become clear later on in the talk. It's also good to speak after Eve, who is partly to blame for converting me from an engineer to a neuroscientist. Now, I used to work in olfaction and that would certainly have been more suitable for um, Obed's celebration, maybe to talk about olfaction. Unfortunately, these days I work on visual motor integration, and that is what this talk is going to be about. So let me first just go over what I mean by sensory motor integration, and maybe before that, sensory motor transformation. So Chun Fang earlier showed some data from flies that are performing an escape, and this is a locust doing the same thing. So as this object looms on the locust eye, let me try and move this down. So as this object looms onto the locust eye, the locust responds with an escape and it kind of takes off. But if you think about what's involved in something that seems relatively simple and innate, it's actually a fairly complicated thing that has to happen. So here is a photoreceptor array, and we just pick out two photoreceptors. Well, as the object looms, and that's this gray thing becoming larger and larger, what has to happen is that different photoreceptors are activated kind of after a little delay. So at first maybe the red photoreceptor is activated, then after a while the one further away is activated and you get these two um, responses. And so if you map that out in a phase plot and you look at how the two photoreceptors respond over time, at first that's the time point one, at a discrete time interval later it's this, then this, then this. So there's a trajectory that this photoreceptor array takes. And somehow that has to be converted um, and transformed into something that actually is a motor action potential series and in flexors and extensors eventually leading to this co-contraction and then the extension which creates the jump. So there's sort of a, an implicit coordinate transformation that has to happen here from something up here into something in the joints and then eventually the kickoff that gives you the escape. So one of the questions that in general people are interested in when it comes to sensory motor integration or transformation is how sensory input which is in a particular reference frame, gets eventually converted through whatever filtering operations that go on in the brain that are, as, as Jing pointed out, driven largely by evolution. Um, and then eventually you get a motor output at the other end in a completely different reference frame. So how does that happen and what processes go on? So that's sort of 
I'm interested in understanding principles by which these kinds of things happen. But this is still kind of a basic picture of um, how sensory motor transformations work. And as you've already heard from Jing, things can be quite different if you have a hungry fly versus a starved fly. So even the basic sensory step or the sensory motor processing step is influenced by maybe the time of day, circadian rhythm, people study that. And, and of course, it's influenced by experience and learning, and you just heard about some of that from Eric. So clearly, it's not so simple as just you know, taking a sensory input and converting it into motor output. It's context dependent. But we're actually interested in yet another little twist to this story. This is still a, basically a feed-forward kind of circuit, which is modulated um, you know, by different things. What we are interested in um, in my lab, at least for the moment, is how even the movements themselves, the motor output itself, um, actually leads to changes further up the sensory stream so that there's actually feedback in the system in a very basic fundamental sense. Any sensation tends to be, or most sensation tends to be active sensation. So there's a motor thing that's implicit in sensing. And further, if the brain happens to know about what the sensory, what the likely change in sensory environment is likely to be when it moves. So for example, let's say that we're looking at Uppi's um, rodents that are trying to track this odor plume or the chocolate trail. Well, it turns out that the sensory input is hugely dependent on the motor output that the animal produces. And so is it possible that the brain, in fact, uses advanced knowledge of what the motor output is going to be and how the sensory environment might change as a consequence of that? Is it possible the brain uses that to perform sensory processing a little differently? And so that's the kind of modulation that I'll try and convince you happens in the fly. And I'll, uh, you know, some of you have heard this before because I've been here very often at NCBS. But for the rest of you, hopefully this will be interesting. All right, so of course you could study this in many different systems, and people do. Um, what system do we study it in? Well, um, I study it in insects. Now, my first, the very first introduction to insects came in Gilles Laurent's lab at Caltech. Um, he introduced me to insects as a research subject, but an eminent collaborator of Obed's, that is Seymour Benzer, is the one who introduced me to insects as a culinary delicacy. So he loved to do this thing where he would feed you larvae and crickets and things like that covered in chocolate. Uh, chocolate appears a few times here. And then he'd watch really closely. If you hadn't experienced you know, the crunch of, of cuticle before, he'd look to see how you reacted to this. I don't know if Chun Fang has experienced this or if Obed has, but it was quite interesting. And you know, I, I can't say I've been converted to insect food yet, but yeah, well. Now, obviously, food is not a good reason to study flies. I mean, they're not particularly tasty. This is in contrast to why Eve chose crabs. Um, this, I think, is, is the real reason she chose that. But luckily, they come with other tools. And so, as you've heard before, and as Obed has contributed to very much, um, the fly is remarkable for the range of perturbation tools it offers. And perturbation, at this point, includes so many different effectors, Shibiri being uh, one of them, of course. But in addition, you can target these to very specific neural populations and subpopulations in the brain. So for example, in, in Jerry Rubin's lab, they're generating all these GAL4 lines that allow you to, to target very specifically different regions in the fly brain. And so this combination is, of course, why uh, it's so attractive to us. Now, uh, this, this would still be all very good, except as a systems neuroscientist, what I really care about is trying to use these tools in the context of physiology. This is where I, I kind of hope sometimes that uh, it would have been nice if Obed had chosen maybe a larger critter to actually do neurogenetics on because the fly can be kind of painful for this. But of course, now there's a lot of different tools. Many different labs have helped create these. And this is, this is for Obed in the sense that I could have chosen other systems, but we have done olfactory work in, in just to uh, build some techniques and, and kind of expand techniques that already exist. And so this is all going to be olfactory data. And it's the only olfactory data I will show. So one of the things we do is um, build new calcium indicators in collaboration with Lauren Luger's lab and test them as part of something called the genetically encoded calcium indicator team. And so you know there are new indicators that just keep improving. And, and Jing, I think, showed you data from GCAMP 1.3 and GCAMP 3. There's now a GCAMP 5. And each GCAMP gets better and better in different ways. So maybe you get a more responsive GCAMP, so you get a larger response. Or you get a GCAMP that has a better dynamic range so that what looks like a flat line up here in a saturating odor response uh, to octanol of increasing concentrations 
can now suddenly look like maybe not quite so saturating. Maybe the response keeps going up. So these are indicators that give you better and better readouts of neural activity. Um, and, and so that's something we're very excited about. But of course, there's um, older methods or, or more traditional methods, which include physiology, which you can do in combination with two photon imaging and target particular subsets of neurons, in this case, a projection neuron, um, and, and read off responses that way. And then um, more recently, we've also been playing with extracellular recording. And it, this is in two contexts, but in the context I'm showing you here, this is actually in larval olfactory receptor neurons. Uh, and this is in the context of chemotaxis, another thing that Obed has looked at a long time ago. Osmotropotaxis is, is one of his uh, nice papers. And so here what we were doing is expressing channel rhodopsin in a select olfactory receptor neuron, OR42A, and then recording um, from that from the whole bundle with a suction electrode, and then finding that if we stimulated with light a little bit earlier before we delivered the odor pulse, we could then use that information of which spikes appeared, these spikes being the ones that appeared, which spikes appeared just in response to the light. We could use that information to classify the ones that are responding to the odor as OR42A neurons. So because we express channel rhodopsin just in those neurons, we could kind of go back and say, well, the light-stimulated neurons are these ones, Presumably, these are the same ones are now in the odor response, and so we can kind of measure with an extracellular electrode something quite specific from a single olfactory receptor neuron. Okay, so these are all tools. Uh, how do we use them? Well, so the way we have sought to pursue this stuff is by starting with quantitative behavior in free walking or free flying flies, taking that behavior to tethered flies, and this, this can be somewhat challenging as anyone who's tried to take behavior from freely moving animals to tethered animals knows. And then finally doing physiology in the context of a behaving fly. So especially if you're studying sensory motor integration and if you choose to set up the problem as something where you want to look at how motor state influences processing throughout the chain, it's important to actually have the animal behaving when you record. And so that's what we seek to do. And then finally, we, we try to have models of what we're doing and then close the loop with that um, with perturbation again. So if you have a model to test, you can test it with all the wonderful tools that uh, you all know about and then look at the responses both with physiology and on behavior. All right, so what's the specific thing we tried to do here? We tried to build techniques that would allow us to do this kind of rigorously in the context of a specific behavior. So one of the things we use, and this is where Eric comes in, we used a technique that he came up with, um, oh, about 35 years ago. So this is the Buchner ball, named after Eric. Um, and he did this in the 70s, and we put the fly on a ball, and then the one difference is that we now do some calcium imaging while we're uh, doing that, or we stick an electrode uh, into the fly's brain while it's actually walking on the ball. And so that's one technique we use. Um, we, we would like to ideally explore this, um, this kind of vast span of behaviors ranging from very simple to very complex in this kind of setup, where you have a tethered fly either walking or flying. But we started with something that's a relatively basic behavior. So this is the, the so-called optomotor response. So if you have a bunch of bars that look like this, vertical bars that look like this, well, if you move these vertical bars around from this side to that side, the insect tends to move to compensate for this large field motion. So this is important for course control. If I'm walking towards there and the whole world suddenly appears to move this way, I kind of compensate for it if I didn't create that motion so that I can keep stay on target and keep moving towards what I was moving towards. So that's the behavior we chose to look at first. And so that's the kind of visual arena in which we looked at it. And of course, this behavior is a wonderful one to watch in, in free walking flies, as shown here. This is clockwise rotation, and you'll see most of the flies are going around like this. They also show you, show you the same thing when they're flying. So this is a fly that's, um, this is a bunch of flies that are flying around, following motion that's going round and round like this. So they'll do this endlessly. They'll do this for hours if you, if you want them to do that, uh, until they're really hungry, in which case, of course, they need to be fed. Okay, so that's the standard optomotor response. We wanted to take this to a tethered fly first. So how do we assess uh, whether the fly is doing the behavior or not? In a flying fly, we do that by looking at the envelope of its wing beat. So this is similar to a technique that Michael Dickinson has used and long before him, I mean, people have done this, Carl Goetz has done this. Um, but basically, you're trying to measure the fly's response in a tethered fly by monitoring its wing beat and trying to detect when it moves left or right. And then based on the wing beat envelope, you can tell whether the fly intends to turn left or right. 
on the ball, we can do this by just sensing ball motion. So we use optical mouse sensor chips to watch what the ball does, and that gives us several degrees of freedom that we capture of the ball and therefore the fly as it moves left or, or as it wants to move left or right. So we can infer that from the ball's motion. So how does the optomotor response work in a tethered fly? It turns out it does rather well. So this is a tethered fly, but we're kind of, this is a virtual trajectory it's taking through space. And so as the stripes move left or right, the fly follows along quite nicely with some delay sometimes, as you can see over here, the stripe is moving to the left, it takes a little while and then moves off to the left and so on and so forth. It does the same thing in flying flies. So we're monitoring the wing beat of both the right and the left wing. So there's the right wing and the left wing. And depending on this phase, whether the motion of the world is to the right or the left, the fly increases one wing beat or the other, and it kind of turns along with the large field motion that it experiences. Right, so uh, what is the model for how this kind of thing happens? What, what, what does the motion sensing and this motion preference that the fly seems to display? It turns out there's a nice model that's been around for a long time uh, called the Rijkaard correlator. And that's based on essentially having photoreceptor arrays that pick up motion in one direction because first this is activated and then that, and then a multiplication with a temporal filter in there gives you directional sensitivity. So if this is activated first and then that, and you have the appropriate delays built in, well, a multiplication will produce an input, uh, produce an output that means something. If it's in the opposite direction, it won't for this, this particular channel and so on and so forth. So there is this existing model of what happens. We chose to look at the downstream targets of what are presumably these elementary motion detectors. And that target of physiology was the lobular plate tangential cells. So these are neurons that have been studied a lot um, in, in the fly, in larger flies especially, in blowflies. They have huge dendrites that span a large visual field and incorporate information from many channels, many omatidia. And what these neurons do uh, with their arbors is essentially detect motion going across the photoreceptor array. Okay. So in this particular case, there's an HS naught, the horizontal um, motion sensitive cell that detects motion in this plane. HS equator detects it in this plane and so on and so forth. And as you move the world back and forth, these neurons respond with depolarizations or hyperpolarizations. We can do the same sort of thing now with um, optical imaging. So when we image from either the dendrites or the soma of one of these HS neurons, we get a large calcium response when movement is in the preferred direction of the fly and nothing or sometimes a dip when it's moving in the null direction. So these cells are responsive to motion in a particular direction. So this is this gives you a tuning curve. If you plot motion moving in all different directions, if you present motion moving in all different directions and record the responses, you get a tuning curve of sorts from this. And you can get a different kind of tuning curve, which is based on the speed of that motion. So the motion could be slow, it could be faster, it could be really fast. And based on that, you get a tuning curve, which reflects the properties of the upstream filters that tells you, well, it responds best to motion that's going at maybe one hertz, in this case, in a stationary fly anyway. And then as the motion moves faster and faster, it responds less. Okay, so what Johannes in this particular case sought to do uh, with Eugenia and Michael Reiser, my close collaborator at Genelia, is record from um, these horizontal sensitive cells in the context of behavior. So some of you have seen this before. Here's the soma of HS North. The fly is walking on a ball over here. This is the visual stimulus that's gonna be presented to the fly. And initially the fly is just walking straight forward. This is the angular rotation of the ball. You'll notice the ball is starting to move like this now. It's always walking forwards, but there's a turn in there. This is the, the green signal is the imaging response. So this is the calcium response, the calcium transient of GCAMP3. This is motion in the non-preferred direction of the, this particular neuron. So this neuron, which is on this side, doesn't care about motion in that direction. It cares about motion going this way, and that's what you'll see next. So now this is motion going in the preferred direction of this neuron. The fly, of course, has a behavioral response that's opposite what it had before. And there you have it. So the neuron is essentially showing a large calcium response um, that increases, and the fly responds with behavior as well that correlates with it. So you can do this trial after trial after trial, and you get plots that look like this. Um, you can see it in single trials. And if you look at the correlation between physiology and behavior, it's very high. This is about one or two percent of the trials show you something odd, but most of them do very, very fine. You can do the same thing in a flying fly. So this is a flying fly that flies in one direction and then the other. 
Again, the red and the green, and sorry, the red and the blue are indicators of the wing beat envelope. The green indicates the calcium response, but you can kind of see the wing beat all the way here uh, without too much effort. This is a dendrite, an HS dendrite that we're imaging in now during flight. So now the pattern's gonna go to the left. You'll see a response here. It's not as huge as you saw in the, in the other case because we were recording from the soma, but it's 100% response. And the fly responds with a turn to the left, which is consistent with the movement of the world. So we can do these experiments where now, in the context of an optomotor behavior, we're recording the physiology of the neurons so that we can start to correlate neural function to behavior. One thing that appeared when we did this, though, and this is what Johannes saw, was in a stationary fly, he would get responses to this sensory stimulus that looked like this. These are neurons that have been characterized as visual neurons, visual sensory neurons. Well, it turns out that when the fly behaves, when the fly is actually doing its thing, to the exact same visual stimulus that appears on its eye, you get a response that looks something like this. So the response is, has a huge gain when it happens to be during behavior, during the visual flight, uh, during flight. Two, oh, I thought it was five, all right, okay. Uh, all right, it turns out that this response is also something you can, the, the gain difference is also something you could see in VS neurons, which are vertical sensitive neurons, and this is something Gabi Mehman in Michael Dickinson's lab saw. So you see a depolarization, and you see um, an increased synaptic activity. So is it two, or I do have two, all right. Okay, no, no. Um, you see the same thing when the fly is walking. So when the fly wa is stationary, you get a response that, look like, that looks like this, and then this is a gain increase when it's walking. This is, again, to an identical visual stimulus. So one interesting question is why you would have something like this, and one idea is, well, when the fly is not aroused, when it's just standing around, it, need, it can conserve energy by not having a huge response every time because, of course, synaptic activity costs um, energy. And then it turns out this is a principle that happens to be used elsewhere as well. So the mouse visual cortex, people have reported quite the same thing. So you have a modulation of visual responses in primary, in V1, based on the behavioral state of the mouse, depending on whether it's running on a ball or not. We also noticed that, in fact, this so-called sensory neuron was almost like a motor neuron. You could kind of correlate the rotational speed of the fly with the delta F by F, the change in calcium activity, and you get almost a straight line right there. So it's, it's almost like it's a motor neuron. The, the modulation is that strong. And finally, we noticed that if you looked at the tuning curve, which I showed you before, to image speed, that tuning curve was not just shifted up, but to the side. The peak of the tuning, this is a log scale. So this is a three hertz peak instead of a one hertz peak. That's the difference between motion going like this and going like this. So the peak tuning of this neuron changes depending on the motor state of the animal, and the gain is disproportionate towards the higher speeds. Why would you have something like that? Well, the interpretation there was if you're walking through the world, the image speed on your eye, the, the speed of the world on your eye, just increases as you walk faster and faster. And so it makes sense that the early sensory system would care about this and correspondingly shift its tuning to match the expected change in statistics of the image input. So that's what we think was going on. The prediction we made was that you'd have an increased shift for flying because that's even faster. And sure enough, in Axel Borst's lab, they've done these experiments where in a flying fly, the peak shifts, or the, the peak and the gain, seems to shift even more to the right. So that in a, in a larger fly, in a tethered blow fly, they've done these experiments where the peak shifts all the way to seven hertz. Now, the, the question you might ask is, how mechanistically is this done? Well, the answer um, is gonna involve changes to, of course, the filters upstream. That's how you can maybe get both the gain increase and the, and the tuning changes. Eve will not be surprised. I mean, this is something she'd have said 30 years ago, but neuromodulators are likely the culprit. If you put boron octopamine, you get much the same effects, not quite the same thing, much the same effects as you see with um, these tuning curve changes in flight versus stationary or walking versus stationary. Finally, I'll just add that this is something that is not just happening at the lobular plate. This is not just a late stage of the sensory system thing. Even earlier in the system, so this is work done, or it's cut off, by John Tuttle uh, in my colleague Michael Reiser's lab. Even early in the medulla, you get the same kind of gain changes, state-dependent gain changes, and the same neuromodulator effects that you see early, uh, later on in the sensory system. Okay, to summarize, as I said, this is a process, sensory motor integration is a process of motor state is definitely part of how sensory processing works including, in fact, tuning of the system. So it's not just um, that you get a gain increase, you actually change the tuning of sensory neurons, and we think it's likely mediated by neuromodulators. 
So going forward, we hope to have more complex behaviors. So this is a place learning thing that I encourage you to go watch if you haven't. It's a recent paper um, from Michael Reiser's lab. Um, basically, flies can learn to associate temperature changes, a temperature with a particular place in their surroundings based on the visual input. So you, if a particular spot indicates a cool spot in an otherwise hot environment, they'll start learning that very, very quickly. Um, we'd like to take those kinds of things uh, to the rig. We are doing more and more closed loop behaviors. This is where the fly's behavioral response is fed back into the virtual world. So essentially, it, it can do, you can do physiology in the context of a VR arena. So you know, the fly sort of wanders through a virtual landscape, and you're trying to associate different objects in that landscape with punishments or rewards, and you, you're trying to see what happens in the circuits. OK, that'll do it um, for me. I'd like to just thank a few people. Uh, the work you saw was mostly done by my two postdocs, um, Evgenia Kiape and Johannes Selig. But it's in collaboration with a bunch of others. Janelia is, has the open environment that I think someone referred to as being true of uh, TIFR in the early days. Um, so I'd like to thank Michael Reiser in particular, but a whole bunch of others, uh, and also the other folks at Janelia, the shared resources at Janelia, who helped make some of this so easy. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. I think we'll just take one question, so that, uh, since we have to move on. Uh, so all of this suggests that there are ascending neurons going into these uh, sites and actually feeding in. Do we know what these are? No. So one possible candidate are haltiers, sensors from the haltiers, which do get affected by walking. And so presumably there's some mechanosensory input, something from the haltiers that goes in, triggers release of octopamine somehow, and then things happen. But we don't have clear ideas for who that is. Haltiers are the likeliest suspect. OK, Upal, you put up your hand. One last one. That's it. Uh, Vic, I was curious, your uh, calcium responses kept on rising over a very, very long time course. Is this reflected in the spiking too? So in this particular case, unfortunately, these are non-spiking neurons. So this has a membrane depolarization. So we think what's going on is it's a voltage-dependent calcium thing. So basically, these channels open. As, as it's depolarized, the calcium keeps pouring in. The calcium levels build up. And then eventually, it decays. But we're not, I mean, these are non-spiking neurons. So that makes our job a little bit. Usually, I give you data where we correlate this thing with spiking, but we can't do that in this case. So, Thank you, Vivek. I'm sure there are a lot more questions, but I, you can catch up on tea time with all the three speakers. Thank you so much. We'll have a 10-minute tea break and be back at 4 p.m.